Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. My name is Seth Levine, and I'm pleased to be here as part of the University Technology Office at ASU to help support the technology for this event. You'll find that your mic, camera, and chat are all disabled for this webinar so that you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentations. The Q&A button in the Zoom toolbar will allow you to submit questions you have now or as they occur to you throughout the event. Ambassador Ray will moderate those questions later in the program. If you have technology problems, you can send a message through the Q&A and I will try to address them for you. To get the program underway, here's the host of the ASU Washington Diplomatic Roundtable, ASU Ambas Ambassador in Residence, Michael Polt. Thank you very much, Seth, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to ASU's inaugural Washington Diplomatic Roundtable. We appreciate you joining us today in the virtual space, and we look forward to hosting you for our future roundtables in person at the Barrett O'Connor Center in downtown DC, and also in Tempe in Arizona. The ASU Washington Diplomatic Roundtable is a quarterly event hosted by the university's Leadership, Diplomacy, and National Security Lab. Our goal is to engage Washington's foreign affairs community with ASU's international initiatives based on the university charter of inclusion and student success and impact. I'm joined in our lab by my colleagues, Lieutenant General Ben Frakley, Ambassadors Moore and O'Donnell, our Senior Director, Kathy Cook, Senior Coordinator, Ashley Wright, and our newest member and program coordinator, Nikki Henshaw. This first roundtable launches ASU as the new institutional home to the American Diplomacy Project, Phase Two, a nonpartisan initiative to reform, rebuild, and reimagine America's diplomatic core. At future roundtables dedicated to this initiative, at ASU in Tempe in Arizona and back in Washington again, the project team will take stock of progress and report final conclusions. I'm very grateful that ASU Assistant okay. Vice President for Media Relations, Jay Thorne, and Strategic Communications Manager, Anne DeGraw are with us today. Jay and his team will guide and support the project's media outreach strategy. Led by our co-chairs, Ambassadors Mark Grossman and Marcy Reese, this project, in collaboration with the Una Chapman Cox Foundation and ASU, will build on a report published in 2020 by Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Before I turn over the floor to Ambassadors Grossman and Reese, who will introduce our project leadership team, I'm honored to highlight our lab's special guest today dedicated to the goal of advancing character-driven leadership in our country, Violet Protest. Violet Protest's call for respectful civil discourse makes a similar national appeal as our project's initiative. Led by treasured Arizona artist Ann Morton, Violet Protest is a nationwide public engagement project that employs handmade textiles as tools for protest against political divisiveness and instead generates a creative call for national unity. The color violet symbolizes the literal combination of red and blue, familiar symbols of our nation's differing ideologies. Thousands of makers from across all 50 states, the District of Columbia and Canada have contributed eight by eight inch squares using a variety of textile processes and equals, equal parts of red and blue to create their individual messages supporting the core values of violent protest. Respect for the other, citizenship, compromise, courage, candor, country over party and corporate influence, compassion and creativity. Just in November of 2021, the Violet Protest sent bundles of 25 of these individual squares to all members of the 117th US Congress as a unique demonstration of protest and to voice its hopes and support for cooperation between lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. 
Thank you to all the Violet protest participating makers for adding your character-driven cause to our roundtable and to our country's leadership vision, both at home and around the world. And now I have the pleasure to turn over the floor to my colleagues, Ambassadors Mark Grossman and Marcy Reitz. Over to you, Mark and Marcy. Mike, thank you very much. And thank you very much for hosting this event. Uh, in the sequence of events here, I have the easiest job because my job is to say thank you to all of those people who have helped us get to where we are today. But first and foremost, I wanted to thank all of you for joining us today and thank you for your continuing interest in this vital undertaking. As Mike did, I start with thanking the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for their steadfast report, their steadfast support for phase one of this effort which produced the foundational report, the US Diplomatic Service for the 21st Century. And of course, so many people on this call contributed to that report. Nancy and I, Marcy and I wanna thank Ambassador Nancy McEldowney, who started this journey with us before she was called to the president's office and Ambassador Nick Burns, who was our partner throughout phase one and is now on his way to be the US Ambassador to China. We also thank the magnificent Lena Chapman Cox Foundation, as Ambassador Polt did, who funded phase one for giving us this chance in phase two, to take the recommendations and the make, to make them operational, to make them blueprints. We're deeply grateful to Margo Branscombe, the president of the foundation, and to Lino Gutierrez, Cox Executive Director, both of us, both of whom are with us today. And thank you from the bottom of our hands. We're delighted that Arizona State University has become our new institutional home. Ambassador Mike Polt has made this possible, thank you. We welcome multi-talented Kathy Cook to the family. One of the things that people have asked both Marcy and me is phase two. And to answer that question, I go back to the words with which we started the Belfer Report that the United States needs a strong, high-performing foreign service and a Department of State to defend our country and to advance its interests in the 21st century. But we concluded in that report that the US Foreign Service is confronting one of the most profound crises in its long and proud history. Many, I'd say most of these serious international challenges the United States now faces and will face in the future will require our diplomats to take the lead. And there are many challenges that we talked about in the report to be met inside the Foreign Service, especially an honest self-assessment of the service's internal culture. There are many hopeful signs. Secretary Pompeo recognized the need to rebuild, restarted the hiring of Foreign Service officers. Secretary Blinken has consistently sought new and important funding for the department and he laid out his vision for a modern State Department last October at the Foreign Service Institute. We have consistently found bipartisan support on Capitol Hill for strengthening America's diplomatic capacities. We believe the time has come to act on specific ideas and achievable proposals to move from recommendations to blueprints. Marcy and I committed ourselves to so many of the people we talked to in phase one, who helped us with phase one, that we would not let this report be another one that just sat on the shelf. And so today we want to introduce you to the superb team that has joined us for phase two. We've chosen four of the original 10 recommendations for focus in phase two, for the blueprints. First, mission and mandate which will be headed by Ambassador Mike Polt. Professional education to be headed by Ambassadors Dan Smith and Joyce Barr. The personnel system, Ambassador Joellen Powell and the Diplomatic Reserve Corps, Ambassador Pat Kennedy. In order also to create real blueprints, we have, we have brought onto the team a professional legislative writer, Charlie Armstrong, who is with us today, who spent a career drafting legislation and guiding legislation in the Senate Office of Legislative Drafting. And for an executive director, 
we thank Ambassador Charles Ray for leading this effort and helping us to bring these blueprints to fruition. We are determined to accomplish this task because just as we did in the first report, we do this work in phase two to honor the women and the men of the Foreign Service and the State Department who work each day to promote and to protect our great nation. They deserve our full support and that is why we participate in this effort. I'd like now to invite Marcy Reese to speak. Thank you, Mark. It's great to see familiar faces, especially those who uh, participated in phase one. I'm glad that you're really interested in seeing what comes in the next phase. In the closing of our phase one report, we mentioned that this project is our way of giving back to the Foreign Service. It's aimed at providing today's Foreign Service with personnel and more and better tools and support to do their jobs. Mark and I and all of our team have seen this project from the very beginning as a collaborative one. First and foremost, it relies on open communication with and feedback from the State Department and the Foreign Service. It's our intention to meet with current officials from the State Department to keep them abreast of pro progress and solicit their reaction as we did with the previous administration. In fact, we will have what we hope will be the first installment of a continuing conversation in the next two weeks. We also plan to continue the dialogue with AFSA, the American Foreign Service Association, on behalf of the Foreign Service that we began in the very first days of phase one. This included, in addition to discussions with President Eric Rubin, participation by current members in our workshops, very valuable open meetings, and a good deal of back and forth with the members by email. The first phase, which included 40 workshops and meetings, was very much about hearing the views of what should be done to reform the Foreign Service from across the foreign affairs community, from past and present FSOs, partners from other international affairs agencies and the military, State Department officials, members of Congress and their staff. Phase two will continue to draw on what we heard in those meetings. This launch event, sponsored by our new home, Arizona State, and your participation in it, will help us make the transition to this next and more detailed phase of our work. We also hope to stay very much engaged with Hill members and staff who are interested in foreign affair, foreign service reform, and in some cases have already introduced legislation to that end. For example, we were very pleased to see a provision for a 15% training float in S3492 that was recently introduced in the Senate. I had the honor just before the holidays of testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee subcommittee on State Department and USAID management, on foreign service reform and on the recommendations in our report. That subcommittee has also held a hearing on specifically State Department professional education. We have listened carefully to the views of members and staff on reform ideas. For example, one area which was mentioned several times was the idea of a foreign service reserve corps which you will hear, hear discussed later in this program. We are delighted that there is bipartisan interest in working on reform of the Foreign Service. As ours is a nonpartisan pro project, which we hope will benefit from support from interested and members and staff on both sides of the aisle. Our desire is that our project and our team, which as Mark mentioned, includes a very experienced legislative drafter, can continue the conversation with the Hill as we move into more detailed exploration of specific proposals. And finally, I wanna end on up with a point about our project and diversity and inclusion in the Foreign Service. In phase one, 
it was clear that this topic is one that must be addressed as part of any reform program. The largest and the longest of our working groups was devoted specifically to diversity and inclusion in the Foreign Service, but many participants and other groups raised the urgency of improvements in this area. We are pleased that the State Department has appointed Gina Abercrombie Wynn Stanley as its Chief Diversity Officer, and that she now has a staff and many ideas for improvements, and that Secretary Blinken in his FSI address that Mark mentioned highlighted the need for reform in this area. We also intend promotion of diversity and inclusion to be part of each of the blueprints that we produce from mission and mandate to the Reserve Corps personnel reform and professional education. We're in none, under no illusions that reform of the Foreign Service is going to be easy or fast, but we are not interested in half measures. Early in phase one, we heard from respected colleagues that we need to think big and bold. And that is what we have done and what we planned on continue to do. Our world and our society have changed substantially in the 40 years since the last piece of comprehensive foreign service legislation. The many challenges our nation faces today are of a fundamentally different character. They revolve around science and technology, cyber, the environment, and new frontiers such as the Arctic and space. They are challenges that will require expert and robust diplomacy to protect our fundamental interests. It will take sustained effort by us, by the department, the administration, the Foreign Service, and the active support and participation of our Congress to succeed in the reforms that we all hope for. The next phase of our project will be devoted to, spell it, to spelling out the specific areas where reform is needed and to strengthen our foreign service. With all of your support, uh, we will hope to have the resources, the leadership and the, and the strong foreign service that our nation needs for the next 40 years. Thank you. Marcy, thank you very much. As I said, Marcy and I and Mike, we're so proud of the group of people who have joined us for this phase two. And now I wanna give each of them a chance to talk about the areas in which they are working. And so Ambassador Joellen Powell, I'd ask you to start with some thoughts on reform and personnel. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Mike, and everybody at ASU for bringing this uh, event together today. Uh, as Marcy mentioned, the foundations of the current Foreign Service personnel system are embodied in the Foreign Service Act of 1980 as amended. Amended, re-amended, added to, interpreted, reinterpreted many times over in the last four decades. And so what we have today is a patchwork quilt of policies and practices that have grown over the years that have been added too many times, rarely taken away. And so this quilt is in sore need of a comprehensive review to modernize and indeed to reinvent the Foreign Service. For those of you who don't know the Foreign Service, and my apologies to many of you who do, a quick tutorial. Foreign Service officers who join the Foreign Service today enter into one of five professional streams, what we call cones, consular, economic, management, political, and public diplomacy. So while most Foreign Service officers do at least one consular tour early in their careers, generally it's pretty hard for a, an officer to get experience in other cones or streams of the Foreign Service. So this has led to the development of silos in the Foreign Service. And within that silo structure, it is pretty generally perceived that the political officers are the, the first among equals. Um, and it's a very competitive profession. It is a profession that requires a range of skills at the top to be successful as a leader, as an executive, as an ambassador. 
So today there are about 8,500 foreign service officers in the service and an additional 5,000 or so foreign service specialists whose careers require a high degree of specialization in a specific field, whether it's diplomatic security, information technology, medical services, uh, facilities managers, all of these contribute an essential function to the Foreign Service. And an important part of our community is our family members. Our families, many of whom work in our embassies overseas uh, or who would like to work in our embassies overseas, and they make up a large part of our Foreign Service community. So reforming personnel systems of the Foreign Service, and as I've mentioned, there are several components of that, it's gonna require us to look at how we recruit, who we recruit, and how we develop the expertise, how we recognize, grow, and promote potential. This initiative will encompass the Foreign Service Officer Corps, the Foreign Service Specialists, and families. And in all of these efforts, we must continue to focus on diversity and on inclusion on building expertise through a combination of training and work experience and on leadership, above all on leadership. These ideas that, that I'm working with come from discussions with many, many, many members of the Foreign Service, people who love their profession as, as much as I have loved this profession, for whom it is more than a profession indeed, it's a calling. So this effort to modernize the Foreign Service and to make it more relevant today and for tomorrow is really dedicated to them, to the men and women of the Foreign Service and all they do for us. So breaking it down into some steps. First, recruiting broadly for excellence. We need a well-funded and a well-publicized initiative for a public service campaign to serve a diplomatic career. And this campaign needs to reach well beyond the traditional spheres of recruitment, what the old saw used to say, pale, male, and Yale, um, that assumed, first of all, that the right people would self-select for a diplomatic career. And second, that the right people would be representative of the richness and diversity of American society. We need to broaden our field. We need to reach younger people. We need to reach more people in more parts of the country with more backgrounds. And I think the way to do that is with a really well thought out public service campaign. Second, multifunctional competence. Multifunctional competence growing beyond these streams or, or silos that we currently work in now has to become the standard for performance. And if that means to eliminate individual cones or streams to require service in positions that attribute specific competency development, Secretary Blinken has initiated a review of the current promotion precepts, for example, and we hope that that current, I'm sorry, that future precepts will require specific competencies, including language. Uh, we would further propose that State's Bureau of Global Talent Management, also known as Human Resources, uh, would have a role in certifying the, the preparedness of candidates to compete for entry into the senior foreign service, which is our executive tier. Um, competencies in the, in the foreign service among the officer corps, I'm gonna set aside the specialist uh, for a few minutes, but it, among the officer corps, I think I can divide competencies generally into two categories. One is operational, operational competence management of resources, management of programs, including direct accountability for, thing, for same. And in that you would have, of course, consular and management operations, but also public diplomacy program direction, uh, international narcotics and law enforcement. There are a number of, of programs within the foreign service that 
experience in jobs like that would give an officer the skill set needed to become a senior leader. The other competency group writ large is policy advocacy, policy advocacy and reporting. And that generally encompasses our traditional streams or cones of political affairs, of economic commercial affairs, and to some extent, public diplomacy insofar as it relates to press and media. So in addition to a foreign service in which officers have the opportunity to build skills in both competency fields, officers have to develop leadership skills. And by that, I mean things like mentoring, mentoring others, modeling a high standard of ethical behavior, community service, whether it is serving on promotion panels or uh, supporting individuals who are seeking broader efforts for professional development, embracing inclusiveness, making sure that communities at state are actively welcomed into decision-making processes and are included and considered for leadership positions and opportunities to lead others. This inclusiveness must be a guiding principle of, of the department's HR practices. And I mean institutional practices as well as individual practices. There has to be accountability in both. Looking at the mechanics of things like career development and how, how officers grow professionally, the timing of, of promotions and, and the, the career development of individuals has to give space and time for long-term training, including language, professional development, details outside the department, pursuit of higher uh, degrees. All of these things have kind of been pushed to the side traditionally as the focus has been on getting the next assignment, getting the work assignment that is going to give you the edge as you compete for promotion. And I firmly believe that we need to slow down that race to promote and give ourselves and our colleagues and officers in the Foreign Service the time to develop professionally. This is gonna mean that we have to break away from a culture that says promote or perish. More time in class between promotions will give people more time to dedicate to what we might consider non-core development, but which is nonetheless essential for a full professional growth. So more flexibility in personnel policies, more time to acquire professional skills, and really refocusing priorities on the development of either regional and linguistic expertise or multilateral and linguistic expertise uh, has to be a focus of our HR systems going forward. I, I think that the department has made real progress advocating for meaningful employment for family members, uh, establishment of the Foreign Service uh, Family Reserve Corps was, was an important step, a critical step, but we need to do more to identify potential areas for employment uh, for family members who go overseas, accompanying a spouse, maybe leave their own careers behind as they do so. Uh, one thought that, uh, that we were talking about when I was last in the State Department was, was in the field of, of contracting, which is a, a space where a lot of really, really deep specialized experience and technical information is critical. And thinking that perhaps we might work with the appropriate folks in the State Department to develop some training and give uh, a, a broad swath of, of family members looking for employment um, more opportunities to serve as, as contracting specialists or contracting review uh, specialists that could 
take on this task overseas and, and have a, a developing marketable and movable skill because that's something that is, is really important for our family members who give up their own careers to go and follow a spouse around the world. Back to specialists for a minute. We need to look at our specialist categories to make sure that the department is hiring the right skills and that the salaries and career paths are a good fit with each other. Um, some specialist careers haven't been looked at a long time and could probably use some significant updating. IT professionals, for example, should they really be doing mail and pouch support? Uh, GSO specialists, are they, are they still needed in today's foreign service? Uh, office managers, what back in the day used to be called secretaries. Office managers career paths should provide professional growth opportunities and, and a career path that takes them to a more professional space, to a more, to staff assistance, executive assistance in, in large embassies and in, in the front offices working with ambassadors. And grades and salaries need to be commensurate with the complexity of the work and the responsibility for resource management. Um, these are just a handful of things that that may be covered in the scope of human resources reform. Uh, there are tons of other ideas out there. I think I've only scratched the surface, but uh, I will look forward to working with my colleagues, other subject matter experts, folks in the department to make sure that as we look at broad changes, that those, in, those changes are well thought out take us in the right direction and bring us to a stronger and better diplomatic service for everybody. Thanks. John, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, mindful of time, I just wanted now to move quickly to uh, the questions of professional education. Uh, again, as I said before, that's the responsibility of Ambassadors Dan Smith and Ambassador Joyce Barr. Uh, Dan, if I might call on you, please. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, and Marcy, and Mike, and uh, Joellen. Ambassador Joyce Barr and I are delighted to serve as co-leads on the professional education and training element of the American Diplomacy Project Phase Two. We'll be working on the auspices of the American Academy of Diplomacy and are very grateful to Ron Newman, the Cox Foundation, and Arizona State University for the support they've offered. Though we are both busy with other work at present, we are eager to get started as soon as practical. We plan to take a holistic approach to this project and look at professional education and training as it supports the entirety of the State Department's workforce, including foreign and civil service, but also contractor and locally employed staff who play such a critical role in our missions abroad. It is important that we build on the excellent foundation that already exists at the Foreign Service Institute and in the partnerships that FSI and the department have built over the years with others, including the National Defense University system and with other public and private academic institutions. As the Belfer Center report noted, people are the greatest asset of the State Department and of the Foreign Service and their education and training, as well as the professionalization must be among the department's highest priorities. To be successful, we will need to ensure that the department has the resources it needs, especially when it comes to an adequate training float. But more is needed, and I think Joellen very eloquently outlined, there needs to be change in culture in terms of valuing professional education and the investments that we make in ourselves and we make in others. Education and training cannot come at the expense or be seen as coming at the expense of other priorities, but is an essential investment in our future and in our most important resource, which remains our people. We also need to ensure that we take fullest advantage of the investments we are already making, especially when it comes to language training, which is one of the primary missions of the Foreign Service Institute. That effort will entail working closely with the other elements of this phase two effort, especially Joellen Powell and her personnel focus, but also Pat Kennedy and his emphasis on the, on the Reserve Corps. We look forward to working with them. We look forward to hearing from many of you uh, and to uh, producing a, a product that we think will move forward 
and prepare the Foreign Service and the State Department for the future. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Joyce, anything to add? Just that I'm uh, very excited about being a part of this project and uh, Dan has wrapped it up for us both. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much. I'd now like to uh, ask uh, Pat Kennedy to talk about the Diplomatic Reserve Corps. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mark. I think as we all realize, urgent international events most often require both diplomatic and sadly often military efforts. As the past has demonstrated multiple times, they also require a level of effort beyond that which active duty personnel are available to, uh, to deal with them. The US military has repeatedly called upon its reserve and National Guard personnel and has developed them into that reserve cadre that can, that can supplement the active duty personnel as required. Unfortunately, the State Department does not have such an asset and it is clearly needed. Constantly cobbling together temporary fixes is not either the best solution nor one with long-term viability. Thus the call, as the report notes, for a diplomatic reserve corps. The concept is outlined in the Belfer report and the work I think involves taking the authorities and the concepts that are in Title 10 of the United States Code, that section which sets up the reserve and the National Guard capabilities for the military and to create and merge those uh, concepts and those authorities, legal authorities, into Title 22 of the United States Code, which is the code that enables the State Department to ask. But in addition, it also has to take that further and build not only the authorities, but the actual implementation, the process and procedures that are required to integrate them into the Foreign Affairs Manual and other documents that drive the State Department every day. And the major issues I think we have to develop are recruitment. How do we identify the skills that are most often needed in crises? And where do we reach out and find the kind of people who can take that additional time? Because this is not a full-time job. This is like the military. This is like, like the National Guard who are called up. How do we recruit and find those individuals? Training and professional development orientation for the Reserve Corps to the Department of State and the US government, other agencies that they will partner with in a crisis, the military, Agency for International Development, international partners like the United Nations and its subsidiaries. How do we hone the existing skills that these individuals will bring? Because that's what we're going out to do is recruit people with specialized skills how to hone those skills and target them to the international environment, which may be very different though aligned with what, with what they bring from their domestic experience. And how do we create the capability for these individuals to function to the highest possible level in a crisis environment with its intended dangers? Promotions, how do we work a, a system that fairly based on uh, demonstrated professionalism, gives them a chance to advance in that career and the ability to provide higher level services that this nation needs. And lastly, pay benefits and retirement. We have to compensate these people. How do we do that? How do we do that fairly and equitably in a competitive world? That's the target of the, re the Reserve Corps, and that's the modus vivendi that we're going to be working through. Thank you very much. Pat, thank you very much. And I think you can see from uh, Joellen Powell and Dan Smith and Pat Kennedy's efforts why we're so pleased to have Charlie Armstrong with us because this is going to take some real effort to put it into the form of blueprints. That's true also for mission and mandate. And so, Mike Pult, I wanted to offer you a chance to tell people out of what your 
work will be about. Thank you very much, Mark. And let me say again how proud and how pleased and how grateful all of ASU is as be, to be part of this uh, phase two of this very, very important project and how excited our students are. All 130,000 of our students are to be part of uh, taking part as interns and as research assistants in uh, helping us to develop these blueprints that we're all planning for. ASU is very, very pleased to be part of the effort. So a few initial thoughts on mission and mandate. First of all, I plan to pick up, we plan to pick up on where um, Marcy and Mark and uh, our colleagues who worked on phase one left off, talking about drafting a blueprint for broadening the authorities, the resources, and the organizational strength of the Foreign Service. I would, wanna, I would like to concentrate on creating greater flexibility of action for our diplomats in the field. Something we all have talked about many times in the past, that many of our leadership have talked about in the past, but we've always found it very difficult to actually implement when it came to actual action. And in that, I would like to take a look at some of the recent examples of US government agencies and organizations that have been established with very broad mandates and looking at the language, the legislative language that gives them their authorities, as well as looking at our defense and intelligence colleagues who often have much broader um, flexibility in executing their missions in the field and uh, taking those examples and building them into the important work we'll be doing. It is clear to all of us that the Foreign Service needs to be flexible, nimble, and equipped with authorities to devote human and natural resources and material resources to address diplomatic challenges before they become lost opportunities or international crises. Uh, I'd wanna take a look at sharpening the legislative language of the Foreign Service mandating that our diplomats, including our diplomatic leadership, should be as the report that uh, Mark and Marcy spearheaded in phase one, should be the US government's deepest substantive experts on the world outside our borders. And that will take some, uh, some, some uh, language that uh, puts this into much clearer terms, that that is exactly what uh, American leadership and more importantly, the American people expect of their diplomats. Uh, in designing the organizational blueprint that gives the Department of the Foreign Service also the lead in executing our international relations, and not just amongst the foreign affairs community in a traditional sense, but in directing the full range of U.S. government assets in executing our foreign policy through our ambassadors and their staffs. What Pat, was, Pat Kennedy was talking about is so, is so apt. There are so many different uh, varieties of challenges and requirements, so much surge capacity that is often needed when crises develop. It is really, really important that the department have not only the, the, the human resources and the material resources, but also the authority then to combine all that US government strength to go ahead and solve the challenges of a modern uh, diplomatic environment. I would also like to take a much closer look at creating a, a more robust domestic assignment structure for our foreign service officers. We all know about homeland diplomats. Uh, we all know about the various opportunities that sporadically and on occasion, many of us and many of our colleagues have taken the opportunity to speak out on international affairs issues and our foreign policy during sort of ad hoc, during home leave or various trips when we're back home for a brief period of time before going abroad again. I think we should have a much more clear, and I hope that uh, um, Ambassador Powell will educate us all on, on how we can build it into our personnel structure to make sure that we have a much more direct way of communicating with the key stakeholders of American uh, foreign policy, and that's the American people. And not just on the coasts, in the middle of the country, in the north, in the south, throughout the country, so that everybody um, has a stake in what our foreign policy is there to accomplish on behalf of the American people. And finally, 
Uh, I would like to make sure that we are true to uh, a man that all of us so deeply admire, admire and having had the opportunity to work for in the past, Secretary Colin Luther Powell, when he reminded us that you do not give people a mission if you don't give them the resources. I think it's important that in the mission and mandate portion of our project, we advocate, advocate for legislative commitment that seeks appropriations for a modern diplomacy that fully matches resources to mission. So these are the kind of things that I would like to focus on, and I look forward to working with all of you together to make that happen. Thank you very much, Mark and Marcy. I thank you very much, and again, thank you for being our new institutional home. Um, I'd now like to uh, call on our executive director. Uh, he will be uh, bringing together the wonderful thoughts and ideas and efforts of the project directors. And Ambassador Ray, I wonder if I could give the floor to you for a few minutes. Joe, you're on, you're on mute. Sorry, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark and Marcy. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been said, but it's worth repeating in this century, we face a broad array of challenges, uh, among them climate change, which is an existential challenge, and we need to be prepared to meet them. Uh, one of the things that's, that I think is essential to, to being able to meet and surmount these challenges is having a strong professional diplomatic service. Uh, and I am deeply honored to have been asked to be a part of the American Diplomacy Project Phase Two whose aim is to create an actionable blueprint for, for, the, for the State Department, for the administration, for the Congress, to create a diplomatic service that best serves the people of this country in this century uh, and represents the rich diversity of this great country in talent and experience and abilities and also represents us effectively on the international stage. Uh, I'm, I'm basically uh, looking forward to my role as a cheerleader to coordinate and support the efforts of these four great teams working here. Uh, and, and I won't say any more than that, other than to say now we will open the floor to, to your questions, which I will moderate. And the first question is from the president of the American Foreign Service Association, AFSA, Eric Rubin. And his question is, how can we get the Biden administration to engage more actively and seriously on foreign service reform? We've missed, we've mostly lost the first year with three to go. AFSA is pushing hard, but we need help from everyone who cares about the future of the Foreign Service. Uh, before I throw that to, to, to a team member to try, I'd like to point out that one of the things that we will be doing in this project in the coming nine months or so uh, is an active outreach program with the support of Mike Pult and the uh, Arizona State technical teams and reaching out to the department, to the other foreign affairs agencies, the administration, to AFSA, to Congress. But I think importantly, we shouldn't overlook to the American people to keep everyone on board with what we're doing and to get their continual feedback on, on this as we move forward. And since Mike's doing the mission and mandate, I think maybe, and he's an ASU expert, that he should take a stab at that question. Mike? Well, thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're giving me much too much credit since uh, uh, Mark and Marcy are the ones who spearheaded this, but I'll be glad to give you my overall thoughts on this. Uh, it is, uh, a, I share uh, Ambassador Rubens and, and our colleagues at AFSA's concern that uh, time is not our friend here. We really need to go ahead and get on with it. And I was so uh, delighted when Mark and Marcy uh, uh, came to us at ASU and said, look, um, can we go ahead and really push this thing forward and be bold and be, and be creative in, uh, in, in coming up with answers and specifics as to how we would actually finally get to a point where there will be some change, some modernization, some revitalization, some reform on behalf of our nation's diplomacy and our nation's diplomats. Um, 
you know, we all realize, having been in the Foreign Service, that uh, when we were in, we always hated outsiders telling us what to do. We always want to be the ones to go ahead and be the drivers of change. And at the same time, realizing that being inside the bureaucracy, being the driver of change is a very complicated issue because there's a certain level of discipline. There's always the mission that you have to take care of. Uh, and you, you don't have as much time for, uh, let's go ahead and uh, uh, go ahead and repair the aircraft in flight. Now we have the opportunity, and what Marcy was saying earlier, and Mark has done the same thing, was so important. We hope very much that uh, Eric Rubin, that AFSA, that the administration particularly, does not see us as some kind of an outside enemy force that is trying to push something on the administration, but rather that we really want to go ahead and engage with them on behalf of something we all want. The goal is very clear that we share, and but we need to go ahead and work together. If we try and do this as, an, as a group with no support from the administration, we know it's not going to go anywhere. And we certainly do not want to create a situation, as Charlie Armstrong will remind us, where we pit the, the hill against the administration or vice versa in trying to make this happen. This has to be a collaborative effort. So having AFSA here, having the American Academy of Diplomacy as, as a partner, um, and, 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 and hopefully in future, having members of the current foreign policy team, part of our effort, part of our discussions, part of our interaction, will go ahead and help us to go ahead and acculturate this entire change that we are all looking for together into an, an action. So it does not just become one more report that so many of us remember that's going to be put on the shelf to collect dust for future generations of Foreign Service officers to address. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, do either you or Marcy have anything you'd like to add? I just have one sentence to add, uh, which is to say, uh, thank you, Eric, for being here. Thank you for what you do. I also would say that uh, one of the charges that we received from the Cox Foundation, and Margot Branscombe in particular, was make this now actionable. Make it a blueprint. Get something done. And so uh, they, they're such great supporters of ours. Uh, we want to follow that. And I believe, Eric, that uh, if that's our philosophy, uh, that working together, uh, we can produce something that people will say, that's right. It's time to do it. Let's accomplish this task. Marcy? OK. Uh, next question is from Joan Polishik. Uh, rather than, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly, if I didn't, I apologize. Uh, rather than expanding time in class to allow for training and professional development, I'd argue that training and professional de development need to be incentivized so people will want to do them. Further slowing the path to promotion will drive people out of the department. They're already incredibly frustrated by slow promotions. Uh, Dan, would either you or Joyce like to take a stab at that? Thanks very much, Charlie. You know, it's Joan Palaszczuk, and who's now uh, the acting Palaszczuk. director of the Foreign Service Institute, and a, a very good colleague. Um, I think this is something that we need to work closely together with Joel and Powell on uh, in terms of incentivizing. I would agree with Joan. I think we do need to incentivize professional education and development, but it does involve some cultural changes in the department. I think too often people see it as, particularly in the Foreign Service, as a distraction. They don't like the fact that uh, they don't get a regular uh, employee evaluation report when they're in a year of language training or anything else. And, and we need to see a, or find a way that we can change that so that people aren't so worried about it. I don't necessarily disagree with the premise that is slowing promotions can, can lead to frustration and may lead to a loss of people, but we need to find some way that people realize that this investment in themselves, this investment in their future is valuable and is valued by the system as a whole. Uh, so I, I, we're open to ideas. I don't know that uh, I would turn it over to Joe Ellen or, or to Joyce, whether we have a, a blueprint for that, but, but we recognize there is a tension in that regard and we need to somehow find a way to, to incentivize that, that investment in oneself. Joyce, you want to add anything? Um, no, I don't have anything to add, but I um, <clears throat> think it does go back to points made earlier. The cultural shift that we need to make so that people understand the value of that training. And that's going to take time. It's, it's, it's going to be 
something that's complicated to implement, but I think it's going to be important for the future of the service. Thank you. Joellen, you get the bat cleanup on this one. Yeah, okay. Um, going back to a couple of points that, that uh, collectively we have made earlier on, yes, culture shift takes a long time and it can't be mandated. Uh, I, I think that the, the whole concept of, of time in class and time in service consumes foreign service officers. I referred to a culture of promote or perish, and you know that that just eats people alive in in the in the foreign service today, and it shouldn't. Um, I know that the, the department under Secretary Blinken's leadership is taking a look at promotion precepts. What is important to to earn to merit promotion? What do we really need? And I think that education training. Uh, expanding people's horizons beyond just what's the next job and what's the next promotion are vitally important. Uh, looking at, at how long someone is at grade before they get promoted is just a tiny, tiny piece of a much bigger issue. And as others have said, and I can only echo, it's going to take a lot of time to shift, to shift this paradigm but it has to be done if we are going to be successful in the future. So Joan, thank you for, for your very, very good point. It, that's changing promotion pacing is, is not going to be a quick fix by any means. And, and it certainly isn't a goal that I'm looking at. It's just how do we get to that better place? And, and the, the pace between promotions is a tiny piece of that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Susan Stander. Ambassador Powell stressed the value of education and training for foreign service officers. Shouldn't legislators who serve on the Foreign Relations Committee receive similar education and training? I I'll go to you first, Joellen, for that one, and, and, and anyone else who wants to take a stab at it. Okay, well, I'll, I'll you know, take a stab and then, and then just in an, another demonstration of how closely uh, Dan and Joyce and I and, and Mike are going to have to work together on all of this. All of these questions overlap uh, our specific areas of, of the project. I would uh, think it would be great if people who are on the staffs of the foreign affairs committees were able to and had the time and the interest to, to join us at FSI, partake of some of that training, absolutely. I think it's a little bit beyond my scope to mandate that they do so. Thanks a lot. Good question, good point. Dan, either you or Joyce. Yeah, I, I would just second that. I think that, in fact, it's something that the Foreign Service Institute has long been interested in. We often invite, or we have often invited members of, of staff from the Hill to come and speak to classes and, and to participate in them. Uh, there may be a greater challenge on their side in terms of the time and energy and investments that they're gonna have to make. But I think it would, in terms of building a more collaborative approach uh, and better understanding between two of our key branches of government, uh, to have more uh, of our skilled staffers join us in courses at FSI and elsewhere. Thank you. Uh, the next, there are two questions, uh, very long, uh, from uh, Carol Bray from uh, Senator Cardin's office, and I'm going to try and combine them so uh, we will see who, who would be appropriate to try to, to do this. Uh, the first part, thank you to Ambassador Rees for mentioning S3492, the new bill to enhance training in the State Department, which was introduced by Senator Cardin, who chairs the uh, Subcommittee on State Department and USAID Management. It was, this bill was inspired in part by the publication of phase one of uh, the American Diplomacy Project. Uh, the questioner is a Pearson Fellow in Senator Cardin's office and would be interested and hearing any further reactions to this bill as well as its companion bill, S3491, which was introduced by Senator Haggerty to establish a commission to reform and modernize the State Department. And the second part is, while there's no doubt that State Department personnel would benefit from more training and professional development to acquire additional skills, 
how will the proposal to slow down the race to promotion affect foreign service specialists who are often with the department for a shorter period since they're expected to join with experience from other fields? Um, again, that's one of those questions that crosses lines and I'll flip a coin here and let me start with Dan and then whoever else thinks that they have an answer, uh, you know, raise your hand. So the, the first part, as I heard it, Charlie, was uh, asking about the specifics of the draft legislation, which I probably- Yeah, what's the, well, what, what are the reaction to it? Well, beyond my mandate uh, as a former Foreign Service officer. But I would note that there are a lot of elements in there, as others have indicated, that would be very supportive of our efforts. I hope that we can uh, help in this process. That is, that, that, that our work will help inform the legislation uh, that we can work together in that regard. I think that there are elements in it that make a lot of sense that, that are moving in the same direction that we're moving. Uh, but we want to have a chance, I think, to, uh, to build that blueprint uh, and perhaps work with, uh, with our colleagues elsewhere, including on the Hill, as we go forward. Charlie, could I? Could I? Yes, please. And I want, I want Marcy to speak as well. First of all, thank you very much for uh, to the questioner for recognizing the link here between the Belfer report and the 15%. Thank you. We came in the Belfer report to believe that that 15% training flow, professional education, it, it's foundational. And so I know I can speak for Marcy here because we've spoken a lot about it. When we saw that in legislation, we thought, here's the beginning. This is the foundation of how we can move forward. Because what we learned in all of our conversations in the creation of phase one was that if you don't have this float and it's not in legislation, you can't do so many of the other things that Joel and Perel, that Joyce Barr, that Dan Smith, that Pat Kennedy will want to be will want to get accomplished. And so there are many good things in that legislation. But if, if I could just say what we learned from our military colleagues from listening to people in the State Department and the Foreign Service is the 15% is foundational. And so we thank Senator Cardin for putting it in the bill. We're supportive of that. Uh, and we hope others will uh, see it as foundational as well. Marcy, I know that you've testified to all of this and uh, think, think similarly. I do, and I, and I wanna add that on, on the topic of education and expanding educational opportunities for our, for our foreign service is something that um, I, I, I'm really grateful that the, that the committee and Senator Cardin have, have put a focus on that. Because if you look at what else is happening in the world in other foreign services, there is a great deal more emphasis on professional education and training. We have a magnificent facility, the Foreign Service Institute. Uh, they give us uh, incredible opportunities. And what we really need to do is to, to build on that, to add some capabilities and to uh, perhaps shift the focus in some cases. And, and in one case in particular, our entry level officers um, get a, a pretty incredible cram course uh, as they come into the foreign service, but why not give them more time? Why not, um, why not make that something a lot bigger? Other foreign services do quite frankly, some of them up to a year. Uh, maybe we don't wanna go that far, but I, I, I think this is really important to think about because we're, we're asking them to operate in a very changed world with a lot of very specific types of knowledge that they will need to succeed. And I, we also wanna put more emphasis on our own history, on the history of the Foreign Service and on US diplomacy. So I think there's, there's a lot of interest in expanding our training uh, into, into some new areas and uh, that's something worth pursuing. Charlie, can I just make one sort of anecdotal comment and Joel and you'll bail me out here, I hope. Uh, on this whole question that started with the question, well, actually with, uh, with Joel's very good presentation and then Joan's question. Uh, on this question of promotion and time, 
You know, I, I think if you if you think about it anecdotally, Colin Powell used to kid me all the time. You know, I had several weeks of professional education and I valued them. He had six years of professional education and, and I don't think it held back his promotions very much. I think about General Petraeus who went to Princeton and got a PhD and I don't think it held back his promotions very much. And so I think that as, as our program directors have said, this is about culture. And it's about thinking in new ways about professional education. And when you, when you think about the education that our military provides for its senior leaders, it's magnificent. And again, I'm not saying we have to do exactly the same. I'm not saying that people have to have six years of professional education, but more than a week or two or five or 10, absolutely. And, there's, and, and I think we can find that balance. It's a great question, don't get me wrong. But I think about senior military leaders, and I, I don't think it held too many of them back. May, may I, uh, Mark, um, uh, Charlie, may I say a couple, uh, one word to yeah. this? What Mark said, because I think this is so important when he compares us to our military colleagues. Because uh, uh, I, I remember uh, Secretary Powell reminding us of this, and uh, and I think when we talk about about a culture change. Our military colleagues see the educational, educational and training opportunities they get as a privilege which they aspire to and they wish to have. Whereas we always think that this is just going to go ahead and delay us from getting on to our next assignment, which is much more exciting. So I think we, if, if, if the, and we talked earlier about incentive structures, if we make it not only a requirement, but also something that you, that you want to have because you're privileged to be able to get this additional training, rather than feeling that, uh, how can I talk to my contacts or my network to make sure I can get out of this training so I can move on to post X or Y to go ahead and perform again and show how great that I am. I think that's going to be the cultural change we need to have. And in this case, while I wouldn't want to emulate everything our, our military colleagues do, this is one area where I think they've got it just about right, as Mark is saying. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Ken Brill. It's very glad to see phase one of the American Diplomacy Project is being followed by a phase two. As work proceeds on phase two, I think it's important to not focus exclusively on the Foreign Service as much as I'm committed to it, but to also include reforms for the civil service. The U.S. Diplomatic Corps is not just the Foreign Service. Civil servants working in the policy functional bureaus are a key part of our diplomatic team, particularly in multilateral and bilateral agreement negotiations. As phase two considers reform for the Foreign Service, I would urge reforms for the Civil Service also be examined. Rewriting the Foreign Service Act of 1980 could, I would hope, also allow for making reforms to state civil service personnel directly involved in diplomatic functions that would help state attract and retain talented new civil service staff to help our diplomacy meet the challenges of the future. Mark, I think I'll bounce that one to you because you can sort of address, you or Marcy can address uh, the the uh, limitations of the grant to work on phase two? Oh, well, uh, let me just say, um, first of all, Ken, thank you. I agree with the sentiment. Uh, the Cox Foundation has previously funded a number of studies that uh, called for reform in the, for in the civil service, and we hope that those ideas will be adopted from the American Academy of Diplomacy. As we said in the beginning of, the, of phase one, um, we just have to be honest here, is that it's right that the civil service at the State Department needs reform, that the civil service people serving in the department, they need a better way to live and they need a better career structure. We will, wherever we can, try to open that door for them. But the truth is we can't do everything. And so where there are opportunities to show different ways for the civil service to do its business, we hope to show them. But what we really would like to do is inspire people in the civil service and the administration to recognize just what you did, that the civil service needs reform. And we wanna be leaders in it in that way. I, 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 so I say, I agree with you 100%. I wanna open these doors where we can, uh, but we just can't do everything for everybody. 
Thank you. Anyone else have any comments? No? Okay, next question is uh, Kevin Kim. Do members of this project support S3491, the bipartisan bill introduced by Senators Haggerty and Cardin, which aims to establish a congressional commission to modernize and reform the State Department? I tossed that one into the pool, anyone who wants to take a stab at it. Marcy, you wanna to talk to that or? All right, go ahead. Well, first of all, uh, I think we've not sort of thought our way through kind of all of this. What we wanna see is action as quick, action taken as quickly as possible. And, and, and we put out phase one of this report, which has led now to phase two. And what we are focused in on these four topics, and we wanna provide the administration and the Congress with blueprints to move forward in these four topics. And so for us, the question of the commission is sort of off to one side. We're focused on creating blueprints in these very important areas. And those blueprints ought to be actionable when we're finished. And that's our job and that's our goal. Marcia, you have any, anything to add? I, just to say, I, um, I think Mark has, has put it very well. Um, we, we, we really recognized in, in focusing on, in thinking about phase two, um, that, that we, there was a limit to how much we could do at once. And uh, we really wanted, we wanted to do, to work, work in the areas that people had indicated to us they really wanted to see progress. And so we chose those areas based on feedback that we had gotten in phase one, which was kind of the, kind of the vision phase. And now we're, now we're into specifics. So, so I do think that, um, that that is the right thing for us to do. And it, and it recognizes uh, what we are capable of and what our background, what, uh, what our background uh, it dictates that we can have the areas in which we have expertise. Thank if you. I could, if I could be slightly undiplomatic here and with, with no disrespect whatsoever to the idea of a commission, I guess what we think is, is that in these four areas, we'd like to just make the, make the presentation and, and, and it doesn't, we don't need to wait for someone else to think these things through. We want to think them through. And there may be many, many, many other important areas. Don't get me wrong. And again, I mean, no disrespect, but with, with, for these four areas, I guess we'd like to be the commission. For these four areas, we'd like to be the blueprint providers. Um, and, and if that meets with some uh, positive response uh, from the administration and the Congress, we'd be very proud of that. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Tom Boya. Who's going to convert the blueprint into introduced legislation? Hmm. Marcy, we want to well, start off. Uh, uh, we hope that some people will find it very tempting. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the things that we're thinking about here is, is to be very specific, to provide timelines, to, to suggest how much in terms of resources will be needed, how these programs will fit together with other programs. So, so that we produce a product that is pretty well finished. And, 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 and we've um, invited and asked Charlie Armstrong over there to, um, I'm thinking about the way we are looking at each other here. And I see Charlie next to me. Um, uh, to really look at this from the perspective of a legislative drafter to uh, provide them an example of how this could actually be implemented. So um, after that, um, we hope that um, members of Congress and the staffs will be interested, will we'll think that we've thought things through in a, in a reasonable way and will be interested in carrying it forward. I, I think in some ways, uh... Pat Kennedy, if you'd allow me, you know, if I take the Diplomatic Reserve Corps as an example. So Marcy and I, in our consultations on Capitol Hill, numerous members of Congress said, Diplomatic Reserve Corps, what a great idea. And then 
if you think about the capacity that we'd like to have some months from now about going back to those people and say, here's a, here's a piece of paper about how the diplomatic reserve corps would work. And here's some draft legislative language to make such a reserve corps a reality. That's a much more powerful presentation to then just walking in and saying, here's another good idea. And so Tom Boyat, thank you. And we thank you for all the work that you did, of course, on the Foreign Service Act of 1980. And so we are looking for ways where we can, and I believe there are going to be ways in all of these categories for Charlie Armstrong and for all of us to produce specific ways forward that will be legislation and or could become legislation. Thank you. Charlie Armstrong, would you like to say a word or two from your perspective as a legislative drafter? You're, you're muted. Oh, you're, you're still muted. You're muted again. There you go. Sorry about that. Um, no, I no, I, I obviously whether um, whether any particular member of Congress is receptive to the ideas put forth in the legislative proposal that we come up with to um, want to go ahead and introduce it is something kind of beyond our control. Uh, obviously, the the comments from all of the panelists suggests that the idea is to have close collaboration between the panel, Congress and the administration, which in and of itself should make members of Congress more receptive to the ideas. Um, some of these proposals are going to be very involved. Uh, the, legislative, the process of coming up with legislative language is going to be uh, interesting. And, uh, but we'll come up um, I, we'll, we'll, there's some good ideas floating around and we have good background in how to convert those into meaningful legislative language. And it's just a matter of getting to it and hoping that we, the product that we come up with is um, acceptable and attractive. Thank you. Uh, the next question's from PM McKinley, I would just like to echo Eric's concern. Entering a second year of the administration, there are still serious gaps in nominations for key leadership positions, a heavy dependence on political nominees for ambassadorships, and there's no clarity on how the department views reforms going forward. There's not even an acknowledgement of the destruction of the past four years and the lingering impact on morale and belief in the institution it will be helpful to find a way to inject greater urgency into the debate on reform inside the building. Uh, not really a question, but would someone uh, wish to make a comment on that? And thank you for your, your comment. Uh, next one from uh, Edward O'Donnell. How does the new US diplomatic service relate to all the foreign affairs agencies with representatives and embassy country teams, foreign commercial service, foreign agricultural service, and domestic agencies like Homeland Security from the Department of Justice. How can we develop plans for seeking support from these other agencies and their leadership? Uh, Mark, as yeah. our... No, yeah. I... So Ed, that's a that's a great question and one obviously we uh, tried to manage partially uh, in phase one. Uh, a little bit like the the answer I gave to uh, Ken on the civil service. Um, there are obviously needs in all of the foreign services, plural, uh, around the government, and so that's why we laid out the ten recommendations in the first phase, focused now on the four in the second. Um, again. What we hope to be here is a combination of blueprint drafters and inspiration to other people, right? Inspiration for them to take some of these questions on themselves. And, and, and I don't say that in a way to sort of push responsibility off. Uh, I recognize what our responsibility is. But what we'd like to do is start a movement here and start people thinking about their own requirements and their own needs. And if in the agriculture service and at AID and at FCS, some of these reforms 
uh, can be applied to them, that'd be fantastic. Uh, if they can't in some fashion, maybe there will be some inspiration uh, for people in these other foreign affairs agencies, foreign service officers uh, like ourselves uh, to, to take some of these questions on. Uh, again, uh, you all, you'll recognize this Ed, from your own, from your own time. You know, as Marcy said, uh, we've, got to, we've got a certain amount of capacity, a certain amount of time, a generous contribution and donation and support from uh, Cox and ASU. And, and we're gonna try to do the best we can in the four areas that we've chosen. Anyone else have a comment? Okay, we have time probably for one more question. Uh, this one from Barbara Stevenson. Uh, I would urge some focus group work to assess current attitudes of members of the Foreign Service toward training. In the SETS course, a required course for all newly promoted members into the Senior Foreign Service, participants regularly cited a transformed attitude toward training as one of the most significant cultural shifts they had witnessed during their careers. Members of the Foreign Service say they welcome training, but face timing obstacles, can't depart post until after July 4th, et cetera. Can FSI look at offering more training, even if it's deliberate bundle of courses that lasts roughly an academic year so officers and specialists can bid on training as a tour and escape the scheduling trap? Oh, that's a good one. Joellen, let's start with you and then. Sure, we'll start with me and then go to Dan. Um, very quickly before I answer, try to answer Barbara's excellent question. Um, I think there was a part two to the question from Ms. Bray uh, that had to do with specialists and promotion tracks. And to very quickly touch on that, I, I just wanted to say that, that in fact, the department does recognize the, the, that specialists have, may have very different career paths than officers. And the, the two are, are not as tightly linked as you might think. Uh, and one of the things that, that I think we will be exploring is what works best for specialists may not work best for generalists and vice versa. So where it makes sense to try to, to de-link those two and have career paths that are better targeted to specialists, we'd like to try to do that. Uh, back to Barbara, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, in another project I was working on, I looked at how some other foreign services uh, run their professional training. Um, I think the French have a fascinating model where they, at some midpoint in, in the, the French diplomat's career, he or she comes back for a two-year assignment at the Quai d'Orsay. And during that two years, they have a whole menu of training that they accomplish within the framework of the two-year assignment. And so I, I, I think that, that Dan and I and Joyce and I are gonna be talking a lot about how we can achieve uh, a solution that works for everyone that sets aside or minimizes the the challenges of trying to squeeze training into uh, a an assignment cycle. And I think your suggestion of trying to bundle training together is is, is something that we can certainly look at. As I said, I think that the French actually have a pretty good model for it in their version of mid-level training. Uh, Dan, Joyce, over to you for continuation. Um, let me just say, I, I, I would agree fully, Joellen, uh, with your point, and, and uh, Barbara makes a very good point. You're absolutely right. Um, we need to be flexible. I do think that the Foreign Service Institute has come up with a number of creative ways over the years to try and address this problem, uh, including the fact that they have courses where People will come for one week, then go back to their jobs and meet periodically and come back for another week at the end. I think that's a good model, frankly, for reinforcing a lot of the things that are learned in the classroom and applying them in a practical way. And we need to do more of that, to be honest. I think that a lot of the things uh, that we talk about in terms of the training float and the things we'd like to take advantage of would also include more opportunities for people 
for instance, uh, Foreign Service generalists early in their career to be exposed to various parts of the department um, or to be exposed to various parts of the embassy when they're abroad. I think that there are a lot of ways that we need to partner with, uh, with uh, global talent management to, to maximize the training that we do do uh, and to reinforce those things with on the job uh, experience. Joyce? Well, I think the other part of this is also getting the buy-in of supervisors and managers that people have to go. And that's going to be um, part of our challenges as well. Uh, frequently, people want the training, but if you don't think that your boss is on board, you may not ask or you'll go and you won't complete it. So it, it, it's part of a package. But I do think it's good that I think the shift is already beginning, but we have a lot more work to go just in being enabling people to take advantage of what we already have, where they don't feel that they're being punished for it. And they feel like, okay, it's safe to do this. It's, it's not going to be looked at as you should be here. And, and in a, another way, that's where having a reserve that can help us during an emergency would be very useful because it will also help to enable all of the things that we need to do to make sure that our people are prepared and can deliver the best for the American public. Okay, thank you. Uh, I apologize, but we've run out of time for questions and answers. Uh, for those of you that we didn't get to, if you would like an answer to your question, you can email them to me at rayca7 at yahoo.com and I will forward them to the person you wish them forwarded to. Or if you don't name someone, I will try and figure out who they should go to. I uh, would thank you very much for your questions and now turn it back to Mark and Marcy for their statements. Well, I just uh, wanted to thank everybody for their participation. We promised we'd uh, end, this, uh, end this at two o'clock and we'll try to do so. Um, you can see, I think, why Mark, Mark, Marcy and I are just so proud of this group of people who have come together to try to do this work with us. Again, we thank the Cox Foundation and ASU for their support. And as both Marcy and I said, I'm in this because I think it's right to support the people who are doing the work today. And as Marcy said, we wanna provide these blueprints for the people who are serving so that they can have a chance to do an even better job for the United States of America than they do now. So I thank everybody here for participating. I thank this team for going forward. Uh, we really appreciate it. Marcy? One of the points that I emphasized in my opening remarks was that we really do see this as a collaborative project. And that's why we chose to kick it off today by, invite, by inviting all of you to come and, and re-engage with us. And we really hope to have an ongoing dialogue with all parts of the international affairs community to keep receiving input. These are hard, complicated questions. And, and, and we really benefit so much from hearing others' opinions and, and new ideas, uh, things we haven't thought of. So I, so I hope that today really is a, a kickoff, not, uh, not just of the project as a whole, but also a dialogue, a continuing dialogue with all of those elements at, uh, as we go along. So, and, and, and in particular, I hope that the, that the Foreign Service uh, will, take, will take heart from the fact that not just us, uh, but members of Congress and the administration are thinking about what else needs to be done uh, for, for modernizing the Foreign Service to deal with the challenges that, uh, that, we're, that we're addressing today. So, Thank you all for attending, for your thoughtful questions, and, and you should take this as an invitation to continue to let us know what you think. So, thank you very much.
thank you all very much for uh, joining us today uh, on behalf of Arizona State University and the ASU Washington Diplomatic Roundtable. We appreciate you taking so much time with us today. Just a quick pointer, there will be future opportunities in this format of this roundtable, both on campus in Tempe in Arizona, uh, in sometime midterm of this project, and then again in Washington at the end of our project to go ahead and participate in uh, this overall effort and to hear a report as to where we have taken this project overall. The, uh, we hope that the pandemic will allow us to do future events in person, both in Arizona as well as here. And we will keep all of you who are on this guest list uh, to informed about the project as well as others that you think might be interested in participating and being part of this overall effort. Thank you very much for being with us today and uh, have a safe afternoon and we'll see you in the future. All the best to all of you. Take care. Bye-bye.